Hello, everyone. Welcome to Data Byte number 145. My name is Rigoberto Lara Guzman, events producer here at Data and Society, alongside my team behind the scenes, Eli Eli and Amanda, our captioner for today. We'll be spending the rest of the hour together, so let's get ourselves grounded. Data and Society is an independent research institute. We study the social implications of data and automation producing original research to, the, to ground informed evidence-based public debate about emerging technology. Data and Society began in New York City, an island in a network of hills and rivers in the Atlantic Northeast known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral land of the Leni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a vast array of servers and computer devices. In the United States, much of this infrastructure sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. We recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory. And we commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. To learn whose land you are on, Feel free to visit the, the link on the chat, uh, nativeland.ca. Today's Data Byte features three key thinkers in the field. With us today is Brittany Smith, Policy Director here at Data and Society, Sarah Chander, Senior Policy Advisor at the European Digital Rights Network, and Fenwick McKelvey. Associate Professor in Information and Communication Technology Policy at Concordia University. To learn more about our speakers and read their longer bios, check out the event page on the chat. Now I'll turn it over to our host, Jake Metcalf, Program Director for the AI Underground Initiative. Thank you and see you soon. Jake, the mic is yours. So I'm Jake Metcalf. I'm the director of the AI on the Ground Initiative at Data and Society. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to all of our guests for joining us today um, and the production team behind the scenes. Uh, the one, one part of the impetus for this conversation today um, is the uh, AIGI team. It has a forthcoming report called uh, Assembling Accountability Through Algorithmic Impact Assessment coming out later this month. Um, and while this um, conversation is not directly about the report, um, it does help help us frame uh, the conversation somewhat so that we can see what's at stake in the uh, different policies uh, that have been proposed for assessing algorithmic systems uh, in, uh, in a number of countries. Uh, and so uh, let me share a little bit of our thinking about that before we dive into the conversation of the speakers. We noticed that while algorithmic impact assessment was increasingly bandied about as a potential form of algorithmic governance, uh, people using the term meant a lot of different things by it. In some cases, an AIA was proposed as a mechanism for exerting democratic control of government software procurement. In other cases, an AIA was proposed as an internal governance process that tech companies would conduct anytime they built an automated decision system. Um, and would exist primarily as like a regulatory record or a transparency activity. Um, in other cases, an AIA was envisioned as a type of third party auditing practice. Uh, what was common across these purposes uh, is that uh, impact assessment is a bundling together in a single process of both an obligation to measure what algorithmic, algorithmic systems actually do, um, along with an accountability structure that specifies um, uh, who needs to report that information to whom and who is responsible for fixing problems. Uh, in other words, impact assessment appears to be an appealing option for algorithmic governance, precisely because it bundles an account of what is happening and who is responsible for it. In this panel, we will be discussing these, these particular regulations here on the screen, um, the US Algorithmic Accountability Act, which was proposed in 2019 and is uh, according to news reporting, uh, currently being redrafted to be submitted in the current Congress. Uh, the uh, European Union's uh, 
uh, Algorithm Act has a much longer title, but that's its short as its nickname, uh, which was which was uh, the sort of the first draft of it was put pub made public about a month and a half ago. Um, and the uh, federal government of Canada's uh, directive on automated decision making uh, and the associated assessment tool, which um, uh, was released in 2019. Um, in writing our report to make sense of why we saw so much variability on this topic, we decided to study uh, impact assessment from other domains, choosing areas that have some structural similarities to algorithmic systems. We looked at environmental impacts, fiscal impacts, privacy impact, digital privacy impact, and human rights impact, and looked for common features that would help make sense of what AIAs might actually accomplish. Um, and what we found was that impact is an evaluative construct. Now, uh, it's, it's a fancy word, but what we really mean is that uh, an impact is a weird kind of thing to measure. Now, you can't go out with binoculars, you know, telescope, or a protein array and find an impact in the world. Uh, rather, impacts only emerge as a kind of thing that you can study um, when you have a community that needs to create a common and shared object that enables them to coordinate their activities around that object. That doesn't mean that impacts aren't real. Rather, it means that they are only real when a community needs a proxy that allows them to talk to each other. And if you look to mature complex types of impact ass assessment, it becomes clear that many different types of expertise and measurement practices and measurement tools um, can go into the construction of impacts. Uh, for example, an environmental impact assessment report might draw on archeologists, fluvial geomorphologists, civil engineers, toxicologists, urban planners, and a lot more. Uh, all of those experts have distinct measurement practices and distinct tools, uh, yet impact as an object is capacious enough to construct, uh, it pay, capacious enough of a construct uh, to accommodate all of those different types of measurements. But that capaciousness means that there are significant stakes and who gets to be involved in choosing what is measured inside of impact. Um, and so we use this phrase um, co-construction. Uh, impacts and accountability relationships are co-constructed is our claim. And co-constructed is really just a social science way of saying they're built together. Um, so don't let that throw you off. Uh, what we mean here is that the core feature of any impact assessment is who reports what to whom. The what of impact assessment is not really separable from the who, uh, from who is obligated to explain the what. Um, and so here we're leaning heavily on the definition of institutional accountability offered by the organizational sociologist Mark Bovins. He says that central to any formalized accountability structure is the relationship between an actor and a forum. The actor has to present uh, an, an account of a system or an event to an independent forum that is empowered to render a judgment or force changes. For algorithmic impact assessments, the actor would be the system developer and the forum would most likely be a regulatory agency or perhaps a party responsible for procurement. Other types of impact assessment can have different accountability relationship structures. For environmental impact assessment, the actor is the developer proposing a project and the forum is a governmental body that has to consider public input and approve or deny the proposal. For human rights impact assessment, the actor is the company which wants an assessment of the consequences of their business practices, and the forum is usually just public opinion. Um, so thus, when we say that accountability relationships and impacts are co-constructed, we're indicating that what will be measured as an impact is not at all settled. Rather, it is always evolving in response to the accountability relationships that have been empowered uh, to determine what needs to be reported, when a report is adequate, and when a solution is satisfactory. In some domains, the content of impact assessment reports have changed significantly over time. By examining impact assessment regimes from other domains, we developed a schema that identifies the core features of impact assessment, which we call the 10 constitutive components. On the previous slide, we already discussed two of the core components, actor and forum and impacts. Uh, now is not the right time to go into detail about all the others. You'll find extensive discussion of them in the forthcoming report, including likely failure modes for algorithmic impact assessment. But what I would like to point out is that when it comes to policymaking, there are some distinct categories here. Policymakers are well equipped to make decisions about the formal structures of impact assessment regimes, the who and the when. 
such as actors and forum, the catalyzing event that triggers the need for an assessment, or the source of legitimacy, such as legislation or a regulatory decision. But the questions of what and how, such as the methods of assessment and the process of public consultation, are inherently a matter for evolving community consensus. If policymakers either overdetermine these components or fail to leave room for the public interest to be expressed, then industry will largely be able to determine those conditions in a one-sided manner. And so our call to action is that even if regulators can't rigidly prescribe an exhaustive list of impacts and mandate a set of tools to assess them, the, and developers can't be left to regulate the impacts of their own products themselves, they nevertheless remain stakeholders in an AIA process alongside others. As we've seen, regulators are needed to establish a forum to set clear guidelines on when AIAs are called for and to convene a process for deciding what, when an uh, assessment is adequate. And companies are needed to provide detailed descriptions of their system specifications or provide access to their systems so that they can actually be assessed. But outside auditors who have developed critical technical skills for, to evaluate systems performance characteristics are needed too, as are critical scholars who have developed techniques for investigating the social and environmental implications of algorithmic systems. And most crucially, communities and advocacy organizations are needed for their expertise on actually living with algorithmic systems and encountering their impacts. The methods for assembling these disparate forms of expertise into an assessment process will need to be worked out through practice and con contestation. If, but policymakers can create the framework through which these perspectives can come together. Stakeholders can wrangle with each other and the interests of those who operate algorithmic systems can be balanced with the public interest. Which brings us to today's discussion about the different forms of algorithmic impact assessment proposed in the US, EU and Canada. These proposals have a fairly wide range of accountability structures but they're all facing a similar challenge. How can reporting about the impacts of algorithmic systems provide some openings for protecting the public interest? What will it take to ensure that developers do not have a totally free hand for determining how their systems will be measured? And with that, we'll, we will return to our panel discussion. Once again, thank you panelists for joining us for this discussion. Uh, my first question is for uh, Sarah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the EU Commission recently published the first draft of a major regulatory framework for AI called by the shorthand, uh, the Artificial Intelligence Act. Uh, it includes an obligation for developers to uh, assess their products for, risks of harm, for risk of harming core human rights. Um, can you share with us some insights uh, into how the EU envisages the process of moving from this early rulemaking to the creation of actual measurement and accounting practices um, and whose voices will be included in that process. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the question. Um, so following up from what you just said about all the different types of impact assessments, I really have a feeling that the EU's legislation will add even more complexity to this question about what um, what they what constitutes uh, impact assessments and all the different forms that they can take. Um, specifically, because I think that the EU's proposal is really quite limited in many uh, regards, especially echoing a lot of what you've said about the determination of industry and how far they get to set the terms of these prior assessments of algorithmic systems. Um, but before I go into that, I'll just say that the for those that aren't really following the EU's policy debate, essentially what we've seen um, over the last few years is that the European Union, which is a regional bloc um, comprised of a number of governments, has basically set uh, its own regulatory proposal uh, to regulate AI. And the context in which that's happened is that we have had sort of, sort of two dual objectives um, that the EU has proposed to try and meet with this piece of legislation. On the one hand being promoting the uptake of AI and regulating the market for it, or called the EU single market, but also on the other side protecting people's rights. And just to have that context, I think many of the things that I will say will allude very much to that tension between those two dual objectives. Um, then a little bit of clarification. So the proposed rules in the EU's um, Artificial Intelligence Act, which is uh, still at the stage of a proposal. It was released in April. 
Essentially, there is really not as such a requirement on developers to assess for risk of human rights. Essentially, they, rather than using the term impact assessment, they um, use uh, the term risk. Uh, what they, it's not necessarily limited to human rights, but um, under the proposal, providers or developers um, of AI systems, I'm using the term providers because that's the term the law uses, um, they have to create a, a risk management system um, by which they have to assess the potential uh, risks um, that um, the AI system that they're developing might pose. Now, uh, this is very broad, and I'll talk a little bit about like the, the problems with that in a minute. But first, like the first step before you even get to this provider self-assessment aspect of it is that inherent in the EU's um, framework is that the European Commission itself, which is the executive arm, the like bureaucratic arm of the European Union, has basically decided that it will regulate only high risk systems. So we see this in other contexts, this term, but it's a very centralized determination of what is a high risk system. So determined by this civil service, by this executive arm, um, all ob obligations on developers for AI systems are only for what the Commission, the European Commission determines, determines high risk systems. Essentially, it spells out a couple of use cases by which what constitutes high risk systems. Um, AI systems uh, intended to be used for real time or post remote biometric, biometric identification of people is one of them, so facial recognition. Uh, is one example of that used in public spaces, but also uh, risk assessment systems, um, measuring the risks on individuals and also use of AI systems that determine access to education, for example. These are some examples of the use cases that the European Commission has de determined high risk. Um, and we've seen how that a lot of these case studies have played out in already like deployments that have been put across the rest of the world. So only the type of rules that I'm going to explain now apply to th those type of systems. So it's already predetermined what rules apply to which and therefore which type of risk assessments have to happen. Only with these type of uh, systems will the rules that I'm about to explain um, apply. Then there is something called a conformity assessment, which I think is probably closest to this idea of impact assessment. I can't explain the rules in detail because it gets a little bit um, technical and there are a lot of them, but essentially under this conformity assess assessment, providers of AI systems have to do a bunch of things. Firstly, they have to put in place a risk assessment system. And the EU says that that should be some sort of continuative iterative process, um, which goes on throughout the entire life cycle of a high risk AI system. Um, and it requires might require systematic updating um, the provider or the developer must identify and analyze the risks, but it doesn't necessarily speak to human rights generally, but any risks. Um, if the system is used according to its intended purpose and under conditions of reasonable foreseeable misuse. Um, other requirements that the, the providers have to put in place are things like um, having cert taking certain data governance practices, there's a lot of language about having relevance, so relevant design choices, formulating relevant assumptions, et cetera, like that. The developer must examine possible bias. They must show doc uh, technical documentation and record keeping. Um, they must ensure a level of transparency to the institution that's deploying the system. The system must be designed to allow for human oversight and the systems must be robust and accurate. And the levels of accuracy um, should be declared alongside the accompanying instructions of use um, that the provider must give to the deploying institution or whoever's putting the system into practice. Now that, that's a lot and that's already quite technical, but in, in essence to say, I think what we have to think about here is, is this is putting forward a very specific model of risk assessment. Um, to your point, Jake, about industry, I think this is probably one of the best examples of how you can really concentrate this question of impact and measuring impact and risk with industry, because under the EU's process, 
for the most part, all high-risk systems, there are a few exceptions, but all high-risk systems are self-assessed for conformity by the providers themselves. So not only do we not necessarily say that much about human rights, but actually all of the potential risks that um, we could encounter with these systems are basically to be foreseen and to be mitigated, determined and defined by the provider themselves, by the person or the, the company making profit from this system red flag already. Uh, secondly, like there's questions about the metrics that the EU puts forward. So like I was saying before, things about relevance, things about accuracy, even things about bias. These are metrics and maybe on the face of it seem objective, but actually I think they are very subjective um, practices. They can mean many different things in different contexts and they require a value judgment by the provider themselves, by the person developing the systems. They also, I think, and I think this is something that we've seen with other impact assessment systems, all of them perpetuate an assumption that the harms that we might foresee um, in this process of impact assessment or impact prediction can be um, mitigated by the provider themselves and that they can be predicted by the provider themselves. Um, back to the point about um, I think it's the term was like you had in your report a specification dilemma. What about those systems that when used as intended, they harm certain people in certain communities? This whole process doesn't speak to that at all. Actually, all systems can be fixed and all systems can be fixed through technical, technical means under the EU's process. There's also this whole issue about developers. Um, Focusing on developers is one thing, and I think maybe pointing to this question of who has agency, this might be valid to some degree, but also we probably have seen with many of like the biggest algorithmic harms cases that we've seen across the world, many of the harms relate to the context of use, the context in which these systems are deployed. The con and that those types of harms, and whether or not we can predict those types of harms will be very different depending on which police fees force uses them, depending on which um, educational institution is deploying them. And the, the context, the harms, and the imp potential implications are likely to be very different in the, depending on the context of use. Yet, all the responsibility is with the providers, those developing the systems in abstraction, basically. Um, the last thing I'll say related to that, to the EU's process is that we see that, that this focus on risk very broadly is not necessarily compatible with a broad conception of harm. So by centralizing the determination with the provider, it, we also see that we're obscuring broader questions like who gets a say in what the potential harms of a system are. We know that often knowledge, knowledge is experiential, it's lived. And yet this process with pretty much all of the emphasis placed on the, the people developing these systems and profiting from these systems, we in, in essence make this a concentrated and top down process. The people whose like whose voices and, and who are like this question about like whose voices are heard in that question of determining harm. And even does this allow us to prevent harm, um, I think that we then become obscured by those harms that are sort of narrowly determined by providers and private companies, essentially. We also miss questions about what about harms that are not just about individuals, but also experienced by collectives and also society as a whole. Um, and also what about those harms that are not just, um, it can be carried, can be, that are not just those that can be characterized by infringements of rights or by impact. So for example, um, predictive policing systems are increasingly foreseen to be used by the European Union, taking very much a lot of inspiration from the US. How far do harms like the systematized over-policing of racialized communities fit into impact assessments, particularly if they're done by the people and the companies developing those systems themselves? Or even broader than that, um, Edria really learning very much from the work of Seda Gerset and Agathe Berlain and also many others, um, like how, do, how does the increased resort to algorithmic systems, um, how is that fundamentally transforming public institutions and can that be foreseen as a harm? So we're increasingly seeing the economic impacts of the promotion of AI, decreasing the capacity of public institutions, uh, increasing the reliance of privately developed services, 
And especially when we're talking about things like educational provision and private um, and public and policing and things like this, we're essentially having huge consequences from democracy. I think here I'll leave it with that because essentially what we're doing is we're coming back to this underlying ethos of the EU's regulation being to, to facilitate the single market, facilitate the market for AI in Europe, essentially the free flow of AI as a product or a service, um, and therefore promoting the uptake of AI without really any framework to speak to the harms, the broad, very broad harms that might come with that. I think that's uh, a great transition, actually, for Brittany's question, um, which is about uh, how <clears throat> regulation of algorithmic systems might be divided up um, essentially by regulated markets. Um, so, uh, Brittany, um, in both the EU and the US, we see the responsibility for handling impact assessment reporting uh, is based on uh, regulated industry. So. For example, if a financial service company that use algorithmic tools uh, um, in the US uh, would have those tools regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, not by a general purpose algorithmic assessment office. Um, is that likely to be a successful model? What about like the specialized expertise you need to, to understand algorithmic systems? Um, what might be missed if these laws are constrained to already regulated industries? Um, that are controlled by their specialized regulators? Sure. So I will attempt to answer, but to do that, I'll go on a little bit of a journey first. Um, so with the Algorithmic Accountability Act that you have already referred to, uh, which was introduced in 2019 and may be reintroduced again soon, uh, if it's passed, it would direct the Federal Trade Commission to require large firms to conduct impact assessments for new and existing high-risk automated decision systems. Uh, the bill focuses on algorithms that make decisions or facilitate human decision-making from sensitive information. And that would include analyzing or predicting sensitive aspects of people's lives, like their work performance, their economic situation, health, or uh, personal interests. And companies would have to assess whether the high-risk automated decision system in question poses a significant risk uh, both to the privacy and security of consumers uh, and if it results in inaccurate, unfair, biased, or discriminatory decisions impacting consumers. Neither the House nor the Senate bills advanced in 2019, but reintroduction this year might play out differently um, as the problem hasn't gone away in any form. And I think most importantly, as Ruha has noted perfectly, that Black communities are already living in the future of a tech dystopia when it comes to policing or when it comes to all kinds of algorithms that are making life and death decisions for people. And on top of the steady drumbeat of tech-driven harm and abuse, the Biden administration has relevant executive orders and policy ambitions around science and technology. So the environment is absolutely still conducive to tech accountability work, uh, which let's not gloss over this either, is being led in part by black legislators. So, but one specific way that this act has been imperfect as other people have pointed out is that it could slip into creating hierarchies of risk that are disconnected from the lived experience of people on the receiving end of the harm. And to resolve this, I think we need tighter and more specific definitions. And we need more clarity on impact assessment methods, um, especially to ensure that they're done in the public interest and prevent them from being co-opted by companies who are more than happy to grade their own homework. Uh, and so I think organizing regulation around industry specific applications or creating categories of risk based on the use case or type of data involved, I think it's interesting at the very least because it helps us as researchers and advocates to move out of the conversation space where people are saying that AI is simply too complex to regulate. It's just literally not. Um, Deb Raji's MIT Tech Review piece from last December um, on how our data encodes systemic racism makes this point perfectly. She wrote that the machine learning community continues to accept a certain level of dysfunction as long as only certain groups are affected. And that's top of mind for me when I'm thinking about the trade-offs involved in this regulatory approach. When people say, okay, this approach isn't perfect and therefore none are going to succeed, what I hear is that some communities aren't worth the trouble of protecting in relation to economic growth and r and breakthroughs. The legislation isn't perfect, but we also don't wanna see legislative efforts devolve into box checking exercises 
um, when these issues are incredibly dynamic. Um, but I think this represents a concrete step forward that we haven't really seen yet. And like crucially, our governments have a responsibility to try. Um, so now I'll get to the question. Uh, I'm not sure yet what I think about something like a general um, purpose algorithmic assessment office. I think on one hand, as in this case, the FTC's remit is already very broad. And I think the debate is often about whether they have the tools they need to enforce powers they already have or that they are given in new legislation. It may not be that specialized ultimately to understand who built a thing, what they're using it for and who they're using it on. But on the other hand, I get that this is hard to work out when there is so much specialized knowledge per industry and so many industries are being encouraged to adopt AI, which is a whole different panel, like AI for the sake of AI, or again, for the sake of economic growth or competition with China uh, is worth discussing in detail because it creates a permission structure for harm that we obviously shouldn't accept. And I think that's all the more reason why we need to enforce asking basic questions about what did you build and why did you do it and who did you consult? And I think the answers will be very telling regardless of who those answers are sent to. Um, uh, although I do think they should be public, but the answers will be very telling. Um, and so will the non-events that are harder to measure, but that might uh, absolutely happen where having to disclose this information precludes a harmful project from happening at all. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Brittany. Um, uh, for Fen, uh, as uh, we have, uh, as we've already discussed, uh, establishing accountability relationships is a critical aspect of any impact assessment process. Um, who reports to who is just as important as what gets uh, reported. Canada has had some challenges in implementing its directive on automated decision making, uh, particularly around the matter of actually getting federal government agencies to conduct uh, the impact assessment process required by that rule. Uh, can you explain how the reporting structure is supposed to work and how it has broken down? And to what extent do you think Canadians um, can actually make use of this reporting and transparency requirements in this rule to exert some power over the algorithmic systems that their government uses? Hey, thank you. And I just want to begin by acknowledging that I'm right now in Montreal at Concordia University, and it's also located on unceded Indigenous land. So the Ganagehage Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and water on which I gather today. Uh, Jojahage or Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it's home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. And we respect that continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relations with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. And I, and I say this and I begin this because I think this is fundamental. And I think a really important part of what to emphasize about the possibilities of thinking about algorithmic impact assessments and how we push forward our understanding and our literacy about AI. And particularly I'd point to the work being done at the Indigenous Futures Group here at Concordia University and particularly their Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence position paper, which I think it's really critical for, for describing, at least for me, how questions of relations and thinking about these ideas of relations to technology can really, I think, also be uh, useful in algorithmic impact assessments and so building on that indigenous epistemologies. And I think that's one clear way forward for me and something that I'm really thankful for that my own work in Internet Demons has kind of found a connection to some of this work with relations. So I think that's to me, I think at some of the forefront of the field and a part I maybe return to. I think, you know, specifically, I really liked Brittany's comment about talking about the uh, permission structure that enables harm and the use of, you know, pers per persuasive harm from AI. Because I think Canada is an interesting case of a, of a country that really trying to see of itself as a middle power has doubled down on AI and AI as part of an industrial strategy. So I think when I'm talking about the context, context of AIAs, I think it's important that this is something that comes as part of tremendous investment on the part of our government in artificial intelligence and in particular ways that, you know, is kind of is dubious, you know, particularly in the sale of Element AI to ServiceNow in the United States, you know, which basically meant huge investments in public resources. And then uh, the fact that that basically didn't live up to expectations. And I'd really point to the work of Anna Brandeshow at McGill University, who's got a great report about just documenting the amount of investment the Canadian government has done uh, in, in artificial intelligence. And I say that 
context is important because then it helps us understand what's going on with this algorithmic impact assessment and automated decision making because the calls and the push for better AI regulation come from the fact that we see our federal government making these investments in AI and we don't see the same levels of investments in governance structure or regulation for AI. And that's I think particularly important because these same concerns that we might have about where AI is being deployed and echoing the work of Ruha Benjamin about the, the idea of the new Jim code, where are these technologies are being experiments are developed on. I mean, we have concerns about being used in policing at the border. And it also went to some of the earlier work in Canada on Tom, by Tom Cardoso, Cardoso talking about just the risk assessment being used in the Canadian prison system and how that is discriminatory against our Indigenous peoples. And so really there's a context here for thinking about better algorithmic accountability and governance well before billion dollars investments in AI. The overarching strategy of the Canadian government largely has been to model best practices. And so it was an early adopter on using algorithmic impact assessments to change procurement for AI at the federal government level. And it's important to recognize that like the EU, you know, the Canadian federal government has limited agency over the provinces. And so this was, I think, a very con a contained at the federal level, at the government level, and trying to inspire companies to adopt this AIA toolkit, which uh, Jake alluded to, and to see that being picked up. And what it means in practice is that it's kind of twofold, is that departments looking to adopt an AI system or algorithmic system should undertake this AIA tool, which is public online, and that vendors should also be checking to make sure that the departments they're selling to have undertaken that AIA. And the expectation is that these AIAs are public and that they're being put online. And so what has come up is that the AIAs are primar primarily a uh, you know, risk assessment and very much a very standardized form, which is interestingly an open source. And so there's a lot of credit to be given to the work being done about open government and open government initiatives that have led us here. But also I think a kind of a disappointment about the modesty of this proposal and the fact that we haven't seen that uptake. So thus far there's concerns that the treasury board hasn't been able to require other departments to take up and use this tool. So we're not sure at the level of which other departments, and this came out through some of the reporting in the Globe and Mail, that the Department of National Defense was implementing AI to help ease its diversity hiring issues, which raises, I think, a deeper question of why and when AI is being used to, to address problems of diversity. Uh, is, is that the cheaper solution? Um, and that you know there wasn't an uptake in the government to use this and that AIA tool wasn't being done. So in the first part, what we see is that there's a limitation of who's actually adopting this tool. The second concern, I think the one for me is that there hasn't been a, a, a corporate buy-in from anything I've seen here. So this tool is being out there, it's put forward as best practice. We don't necessarily see corporations and I'll talk about that uh, in my, you know, in a bit later. We don't see corporations actually doing these AI algorithmic impact assessments. So there's also this question of whether the soft touch approach is actually effective, and particularly the modesty of it, the fact that we haven't seen a buy-in for something I think which is so uh, simple to do, which is you know really a box checking exercise and a critique of it, you know, raises real doubts about you know, the effectiveness of algorithmic impact assessments. And I think, you know, the final point, and, and this is something that my uh, work, my student, um, Nick Gertler is working on in their, their master's project is actually looking at the structure of that and how really the AIA is something very equivalent to what Sarah was talking about as a risk assessment. And how do we, you know, think about a nebulous term like impact is also very nebulous in comparison to risk and, and whether we can think of this tool and this kind of questionnaire is actually a proper tool to put forward um, matters of kind of assessing risk or kind of documenting that situation. And I think that really speaks to the, the, I think the limitation of the Canadian public at present is that there was a hope that we'd be seeing these risk assessments. This would be sparking journalism and commentary and public discussion about what impacts were being used. And I think a wider concern about where, you know, if you're using AI, why apply it in certain high risk applications like hiring, border security, justice, and that I think would have really, you know, cultivated a conversation a bit more. And I think the disappointment, the lack that you don't see these tools being done is that it really, I think is speaking to a, a deepening concern about public literacy on AIA 
and it's wider speculation of overstating the potential and possible applications of AI, which really put it in a very precarious policymaking context because it's easier to talk about the 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 deep harm, the 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 abstract harms that, that rather than the kind of real and particular harms that AI is, the algorithms and AI might be doing presently. And so, I mean, I think that that's kind of the the sad context of Canada, but I think one that really tampers how. Um, you know, we can understand the impact of algorithmic impact assessments here. Great, thank you. Uh, it was very illuminating. Um, and I think that's a, that's a great lead-in um, for asking Brittany um, about her experience uh, managing impact assessments in a corporate environment. Um, so drawing on your experience of managing uh, in, uh, human rights impact assessment um, previously, uh, what do you think are the major challenges in conducting them, especially with regard to integrating the experiences of people most impacted by algorithmic systems? Um, and and what do you think like what do you think about the matter of knowing when an impact assessment is successful or or even adequate? Right. Um, I, and I saw questions about human rights impact assessments in the Q and A too, and so I will see how much I can do here. Um, but I think there are tons of challenges. Uh, and um, the work is super rewarding. But in my experience, it was also extremely difficult for our, for reasons that we've already outlined so far. I think to start even making the case for this kind of work uh, is not easy. When you start trying to operationalize the rhetoric of ethics, you start getting a lot of pushback. Um, and that's all I'll say about that point. Um, and I think actually in my experience that pushback manifests in a lack of resources where companies are allocating budget and headcount is a strong signal of what they care about. And I was a team of one, um, like less than one actually because running human rights wasn't even my primary job. Um, this is not something you can just tack on to the policy team or the ethics team. It's a, it's a different job entirely. Um, another challenge is about how accountability is structured in a corporate environment. And I mean this both in terms of designing and executing the criteria we use to do an impact assessment and who is responsible for the outcomes um, of that assessment. On the criteria question, this is really difficult because as we've already said, this is entirely vague and allowed to be determined by individual actors. Even uh, in the business and human rights space, where there is a clear set of guidelines and expectations from the UN, it's still confusing how to determine whether UN GPs apply or don't apply to your specific situation. And many best practices are written with hardware or applications in mind. But for me, the question was, uh, how does this work in a technical research environment where we're talking about fundamental theoretical uh, research and a possible harm that might occur when the research is combined with data sets or compute power that don't even exist yet. What are we supposed to do? And I'm not precluding uh, not researching when those answers are non-existent, but uh, this is also part of the problem that the research train is happening and you're expected to come in very late into the process and try to find a way to assess the impact. Um, the UN's VTech project is working on this exact same thing as I understand it. Like they're trying to develop authoritative um, guidance and resources for implementing UNGPs and thinking specifically about their application within tech. Um, I'm almost done. On the responsibility point, this may be obvious, but we have an incentive alignment problem here as well. And that's because when you're operating under the same org level mission and working on the same project, you might still have misaligned incentives. I'm here to identify and mitigate risk, including potentially canceling your project. And you're here to get it done and publish it as quickly and completely as possible. Um, and what was not happening at the time that I was doing this work is the consideration of human rights impact as core to the work rather than a fringe or additional process to go through before the work is published. I also had some curious experiences trying to get people to think of um, human rights impact assessment processes as generative. The impact assessment and human rights due diligence processes can help us uncover ways our work might actually advance human rights. Um, I worked a lot with our team on interpreting the right to share in scientific advancement and its benefits in ways that human rights impact could guide our research planning, help us prioritize positive impact, determine which areas to research and so on. And I think the vagueness and lack of clarity at the intersection of these fields doesn't have to be a doom and gloom conversation, but there is room for creativity and exploration too. Thanks, Brittany. Um, I have one last question for me to the panelists before we move into Q and A, um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to ask it uh, to Sarah. Uh, and even though it's an expansive question, if you can keep it brief, then we can move on to Q and A. Um, so. Uh, 
how, how can civil society organizations like EDRI um, and community advocates put pressure on the legislative and rulemaking process uh, behind algorithmic accountability laws uh, to ensure that they actually have a voice in the table and how assessment gets done? What are some like concrete asks um, and some, some calls to action that we can be engaged in uh, in the near future to ensure that um, the voices of people who are most affected by algorithmic systems um, are integral to the assessment process? Yeah, definitely. I'll do my best to answer a quite complicated question uh, quickly. Um, so yeah, then I think the first things first, it might not seem so concrete, but I think it's essential to do something meaningful is actually recognize that the, there is a real risk that if impact assessments, however they, in whatever form they come, if they're very centralized, if they're exclu if exclusive and don't involve uh, racialized communities, other marginalized communities, and also if they have no real teeth um, as to like fundamentally change how systems operate or actually even stopping their use to Brittany's point, then essentially we have to recognize that they might have an enabling function. And also there is a, an ongoing process of industry co-opting these tools to basically um, further the uptake of their products and services basically. And we need to really take seriously this potential performative function of impact assessments if we are actually then to go on to make something useful of this. Um, I say this because we have to think about impact assessments also in terms of the burden of proof question. So most very institutional processes that focus on proof of harm, whether it's potential or actual, they definitely end up concretizing this burden on communities to prove um, and document harm, whether it's potential or actual, whereas I think that there's like, a, and a lot of scholars that have already worked on this, Ruha Benjamin, um, Ju, um, the Algorithmic Justice League, Mihente, they've all talked about in some regard, this idea about the fact that algorithmic systems, like any other opaque systems imbued in systems of power and structures of power, they're more likely than not to continue existing patterns of exclusion and oppression. And so we, I think as civil society really need to have, think about the claims that those deploying AI systems are making and producing AI systems are making. And also have a question about efficiency. So most systems are optimized for efficiency, right? However, what does efficiency mean? Particularly, again, coming back to this question of the specification dilemma. Efficiency for some means injustice for others. And so whereas like a, a system might be measuring impact in terms of how well it's optimized for efficiency in other cases that's talking we're talking about optimizing injustice basically so the, all this to say i think that civil society really needs to first of all have a question about how far can impact assessments be a mechanism for real redress and accountability um thinking in the eu context we need to like we need to have discussions basically about whether we are very we have a lot of faith in um, impact assessments, which are focused on providers before the market stage, as opposed to develop deployers before the use stage. And if we can think about that little pivot in the EU context, there might be ways to actually stop harmful practices in use. If we actually then um, don't put too much of a burden on civil society to have these really like evidence concrete um, things that they're put, putting forward to show harm that actually hasn't even happened yet. And even in context of structural discrimination, even when such harms have happened yet, we have very difficulties to evidence it because structural discrimination is not an easy thing to evidence. So I think there's a lot of question that we need to push for um, reversing the burden of proof. Also, my last point, and I'll be very quick, is like, I think, like, very frankly, we need to not put our eggs in one basket and think about other strategies beyond impact assessment. So, again, coming back to the amazing work of Mihente, Algorithmic Justice League, Castle Tech, Net, uh, Tech Resistance Network, all in the US have really thought about this question of abolition and applying this concept of ab abolition to tech, not just talking about, okay, we need to we need to stop all tech in certain angles, but also, okay, what are our arguments for alternatives for such systems? 
what are the, the criteria and for de democratic engagement can we put on governments to actually go through a process of justifying to us as communities and as people affected, show us what this will be, how this will benefit for us before use, rather than putting something into use and then asking us to prove the harm after the fact, once the harm has already been done. So switching up all these presumptions, I think, is something that we really need to think about. Um, a lot of Edry's work has been focused on this question of prohibitions too, and we actually like forced the European the European Commission to put in a prohibition um, a provision in its legislation. So there is also, I think, some hope that can be done by advocacy and pushing for as strong as legislative processes as possible. Um, but also, I think in that process, and, and this is for all, this is a recommendation for me from all sort of academics and civil society that are working in a digital space or that have expertise on tech, is that we really need to do better work to situate ourselves. Like what we're talking about here is not necessarily technical. It's about structural harms and the people that know best about those structural harms are the people that work on structural discrimination, the people that work on climate justice. And resituating ourselves not as experts on the topic because it involves tech but engaging people that have that long-standing experience of working about how to dismantle structural inequalities and oppression that's I think where resources need to be shifted to to and attention needs to be shifted to as well. Great thank you. Um, for fan I'd like to um, give you the first uh, audience question. Um, and specifically, you know, like in reference to the indigenous protocol, that excellent indigenous proposal, uh, protocol article that you shared uh, earlier, um, how can we, uh, so this question is from Katerina Kopp, um, uh, do any of these proposals envision addressing uh, cumulative harm, especially to already disadvantaged communities um, and how? Like this seems to be one of the shortcomings of focusing on high risk processing um, it also seems to be a methodologically very challenging. Um, so just briefly, you know, as brief as you can, <laughs> um, what would it look like to actually do assessments that considered cumulative harm and not just constrained risk measurement? Yeah, I, you know, I don't necessarily have the answer for that. And I think that the one of the things to me is that I, I wanted to emphasize that algorithmic impact assessments remain an opening. And I think that that's, all, that's what's in play right now. That's the politics at stake is that it very easily could be closed and it very easily could be turned into something where um, it, it's instrumentalized in such a way that it, that it loses that opportunity. And I noticed also in the chat, there was lots of discussion about say the, the idea of a rights-based assessment. And I think, you know, when I think about the limits of my knowledge and where I'm questioning seeking, it's that I like the neatness of a rights-based approach or talking about specific human rights courts. But I also recognize that that's a very um, abstract European tool and one that also has a capacity of abstracting it out. If people just have these intractable rights, you don't actually need to do the consultation or the work to understand those relations. And so in many ways, I look to say the indigenous protocols and thinking about relations and that, that work of relations and something I'm learning. Uh, I also would emphasize that, you know, some of the work in feminist standpoint theory, and, you know, I look to Louisa Moore's work here and talking about partial accounts in, in trying to say of like, the algorithmic impact assessment is a specific tool. And to, to get into, uh, you know, Katarina's, I think specific point, I, you know, this gets into, you know, what do we mean if an impact assessment is cheap and quick versus expensive and fulsome. And I think that, you know, often what I, I'm most aware of now is the fallacy of participation. And the idea that if participants aren't compensated and rewarded or allowed in such a way that the, co the consultation process itself, trying to address, you know, what I, I wouldn't, I don't know the term as well, cumulative harm, but address is just the kind of disadvantages that participate and create barriers in the policy process presently. Unless there's actually building that in, then many of these measures are kind of, you know, fail to begin with because there's not any way to have people actually meaningfully participate. And I think that that's the greatest risk in many ways with all this consultation is unless you have, I think, fair compensation, making sure there's time and accountability, you know, childcare, even these basic things, 
those are things that really are the barriers to participation, unless they're kind of front and center of the design process for these consultations, then it's not actually addressing these cumulative harms that Katarina is talking about. I hope that answers your question. There were uh, a, a number of questions from folks about um, whether human rights is um, uh, an, like an operable framework for thinking about uh, impacts. And so uh, I, I'd like to pose this to Brittany first, but anyone else can chime in also. Um, are human, are, are human rights frameworks uh, an optimal way to sort of ground an impact assessment, um, even one that's not like specifically a human model on human rights and impact assessment? Um, what, yeah. what are some of the pluses and minuses around adopting that? I think, um, I think uh, a, a not ideal answer is that I don't see any reason why not. I think not enough work has been done on any of these issues so far to say like we have to rule that out entirely for some vague reason. I think that using human rights as the basis for an impact assessment, whether it's an HRIA that's guided by UNGPs, um, is, an, is a totally viable and useful and productive way forward. My only um, concern in my experience is that people who, people have a very uh, little knowledge about what human rights are. I spent a lot of time trying to convince people that just because their research wasn't torturing anyone that they still needed to pay attention in the meeting I was running or that there was still an impact that we needed to consider that human rights are much broader and expansive than let's not torture people, let's not surveil people, etc. So um, I think like basic education on what human rights are and how they apply to the technology that we're building is a big part of the discussion and is not currently happening in any meaningful way. If industry actors are the ones making technology, it's hard to imagine a regulatory structure where they don't have a degree of discretion in what to assess and report. Um, oh, sorry, question moved there. Uh, um, which will allow them to control or undermine the regulation as they need. Um, do any of the panelists have thoughts on how to design regulation to reduce the degree or importance of that discretion by private companies to keep the back end of their systems private? Really quickly, which is that what we're seeing from the EU's regulation is that part of it is about like the metrics and part of it is about also the 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 emphasis you place on, on developers, technology companies in the in the legislative framework itself, right? And I think there is the question around moving towards specific metrics if you are going to make certain requirements and have that level of responsibility to providers. However, then I think you also have to acknowledge that, for example, with the question of bias in the EU's legislation, we have like a, a sort of obligation for providers to measure bias. But I think that these sorts of regulatory tools are not always best placed to put um, specific specifications of how what the obligation on a provider should be in terms of bias. There are many forms of bias. There are many sort of harms that can be addressed in that context. And, and there's so much complexity there that we have to question whether regulatory ways are the, the main ways of making certain providers do certain things. I would really say my one way is to not, if it, the question could be like, to not put the sole responsibility on providers self-assessing. I do agree that there's, and as implied in the question, that there is a level of discretion, maybe that there are certain things that only providers can really contest. But I think it also obscures the broader socio-technical question of harm and impact, which doesn't necessarily always emanate from how the systems are designed only, but also the context in which they are deployed in. And for this, you really need to think about other mechanisms which also take into account obligations on what the person, what the system, what the institution deploying those systems um, should do. Should they engage um, marginalized communities? Should there be an obligation not to put a certain system in use if certain conditions are met? Things like this. And at least in the EU system, this whole area of sort of criteria and legislative options is really missing. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to um, wrap up by uh, thanking the panelists, um, Fen, Sarah, Brittany, and then also uh, Rigo and the rest of the production team. Uh, for making this really interesting uh, 
panel happen. I know uh, assessment and measurement are not necessarily always the sexiest topics, um, uh, but I, I hope that we uh, made clear uh, the stakes involved in uh, having these questions about uh, who is involved in assessment. Um, and that matters just as much as the what, um, and that we can push legislators working on these topics um, to attend to that more closely. Um, keep your eyes peeled uh, for, at, to the end of the month for the report, uh, Assembly Accountability, coming from Data and Society's AIGI team. And um, we'll see you all around. With that, I'll hand it off to Rigo. Thanks, everyone. And thank you to the panelists. Uh, you can stay tuned with our work at datasociety.net. And with that, enjoy the rest of your week. Everyone have a good day. Mm -hmm.